right along to the next speaker. I'm sure this will be equally interesting. We have with us the chairman and senior partner of Hale and Tempest Company Limited UK. That is Dr. Brian Tempest. Now, he has worked in the pharmaceutical industry for the last 42 years managing healthcare businesses in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Australasia, China, Japan, and India, and has led many sessions at investor meetings held around the world from Tokyo to Las Vegas. And currently he advises companies banks, investment funds, private equity, and high net worth individuals on their strategy in Asia based on his wide experience in China, in Japan, in Southeast Asia, and India, where he has lived for the last 10 years. Now, he is one of the few Westerners to have led a Sensex Nifty 50 Indian Blue Chip MNC, and as a result of that, he has valuable insight into to India, and that is why he is going to be addressing us on how Indian conglomerates go global. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's now give him a warm welcome as he makes his way up on stage to the podium, Dr. Brian Tempest, to address the issue of how Indian conglomerates go global. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for that uh, kind uh, introduction, and congratulations to the SEC on their 20th anniversary. Uh, I'm going to um, talk about the globalization out of India, and in particular, I'm going to focus on healthcare. Yeah. The issue of debt has actually uh, impacted many parts of the, the world, but it's also uh, impacted uh, uh, healthcare as well. And um, uh, the forecasts are that uh, healthcare is going to grow a lot faster than GDP and a lot faster than salaries. So the issue of healthcare is going to continue to be a really difficult financial issue for the world to deal with. And almost in every corner of the world, people are looking at saving costs and in fact saving costs in healthcare. But what's interesting is when you look at Asia, you find that actually it's the Asian countries that are spending a lot less on healthcare than some of the Western countries. And as a result, in spite of that, search for savings, actually there's likely to be quite an expansion of healthcare in Asia and in, the, in those particular markets you can see on yellow in this particular chart. So India um, started its globalization from deregulation. When the current prime minister was finance minister and he deregulated things about 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, that's when the globalization started to uh, gather speed in, um, in India. And this is just a, a cartoon from India which actually shows this sort of globalization. You see a number of characters there. India, of course, is the elephant. China is the, uh, is the dragon. And the eagle is America that's watching on. And when you live in, uh, in India, one of the things that is very, uh, always very sensitive is exactly what is China doing. And what's interesting is that actually Europe doesn't really figure on this cartoon. The major players are India, um, China, with the Americans sort of uh, being part of the, um, uh, the activities. Now, when I move particularly into pharmaceuticals and in particular into the sort of this aspect of healthcare, the pharma global business model has a problem. And in fact, this is an article from uh, one of the UK uh, scientific newspapers where 68% of pharma executives thought that the pharma model was broken. And part of the issue is that the blue lines show the expenditure of R&D in the global pharma industry, and the single black line shows the discovery of new molecules coming out of that expenditure. And clearly, if you're spending a lot more money and you're not discovering any new molecules, then it leads to financial disaster, and that is what actually you're starting to see around the world. 
And whilst there is a need to continue investing in R&D, in pharma, to generate new molecules, there is huge pressures that are building up. And it was that scientist Charles Darwin who said that it's not the strongest nor the most intelligent that survives, it's the most adaptable. And that's what the pharma industry is having to do, it's having to change its strategies. Some companies are focusing on their shares and repurchasing their shares. Some, like Pfizer, are selling off bits of their business. Some, like um, Novartis, are focusing on a certain niche area, like eye, eye care. Some of the pharmaceutical companies are focusing on the consumer area, which takes them away from the, um, the doctor. Some are focusing on over-the-counter, and uh, this is uh, Procter & Gamble and Teva, a big generic company. Some are focusing on the inhalers, and some are focusing on generics and the farm emerging world. And farm emerging really means that part of the world except for the OECD markets. It's a sort of jargon from the, the farmer industry. And so this movement of big pharma into the uh, generics and the farm emerging is generating a lot, of, uh, a lot of competition. And you can see that actually, if the, 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 the generic pharma industry is worth globally about just over 100 billion now, it's forecast to grow to about 140 in 2013, but all the growth, as you can see from the circle, all the growth is gonna come from the rest of the world, the emerging markets. And that is why you will see, particularly in the Asian markets, a lot of activity by big pharma trying to get into this particular business. And this is a cartoon sort of reflecting what is happening in terms of these, uh, in fact, it's supposed to show all the guys in Davos who are at the bottom of the valley with two snowballs falling on them, one from China and one from India. But actually in pharma, the Indian snowball, snowball is much, much bigger than the Chinese snowball. In fact, this is probably one of the few industries where actually India is doing significantly better than China. And China is quite anxious about why that is taking place. Personally, I think that one of the strengths of India is the fact that, and in fact, you find the same in many Asian markets, but in particular, the focus in India on education. And this is a piece from the Chandigarh newspaper, which shows all the children in that particular moment in time who got more than 94% in their exams at school. And certainly in the West, you'd never see a newspaper sharing with you all the pictures of the children that have actually done well in their school exams. But this is the emphasis of education that really runs through uh, the Indian environment. And this is a, a cartoon from the Financial Times. You probably can't read the little words, but this is supposed to be a, a shelf in a supermarket. And uh, in the, the sort of the, 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 shelf, the, the box that's got lots of people in it, there's a sign that says, super duper PhDs from India and China. And the box on the right, which has got one cube in it, is actually a Western educated PhD student, which reflects the fact that actually there is a huge number of scientists coming out of, um, uh, out of uh, Asia and India in particular compared to Europe. In fact, the number of engineers and science graduates coming out of India is about 700,000, and the whole of Europe is only 500,000. So there is a huge, so even if you allow for poor quality, Versus, you know, and look at the high quality numbers, you find there is a huge expansion of scientists. There is something like 130 odd thousand uh, science graduates that come out of India every year. So if you allowed for a poor quality, you may come down to about 80,000 a year. And in the UK, and in the UK I think there's, there's been con congratulatory notes about the fact that the UK has reached 3,000 science graduates a year. So there is a huge expansion of science coming out of Asia, which actually I think underwrites why there is such a strength in this area by India in particular. Now one of the companies that actually was, was uh, early off the mark was Rambaxi in terms of globalizing. It started when the um, deregulation started. And this shows the sort of growth that's taken place from 89, when 20% of the sales were outside India and 80% were inside India. And in a period of about six or seven years, it became the other way around, where about two-thirds were uh, actually outside India 
and one third was uh, inside India. And then if you look at the five years that went beyond that, you can see how that continued. So the bottom solid line is basically the domestic Indian market. This is India, this is the Indian domestic market. The, the piece above it is the American market. And then the next piece above it is a whole variety of different parts of the world, which goes from uh, Romania to Brazil to Asia and Africa and the, and, uh, and the old CIS as well. So you can see how that real global um, business has grown so that, in fact, it became a truly global business within about 10 or 12 years where it is covered between India and um, Europe and Africa and the, and the Americas, uh, a truly global picture. And if I was to share with you what is the global generic companies, I've got two slides here. One is the top 21, and the next one is the next 26. So basically, this is the top 50 global generic pharma companies in the world. And what's interesting about this is that, first of all, when you look at this, 40% of the companies on the first chart are from India. And there isn't one Chinese company on this chart. And in fact, if I go to the next chart, 30% of this chart are from India, and there isn't one Chinese company. So there isn't one Chinese company in the top 50. And interestingly, in, um, just a few months ago, I was invited to Shanghai to uh, advise the uh, Chinese government on why the Chinese couldn't internationalize their generic pharmaceutical business, whereas the Indians were, could. And it's an interesting thing for a white Caucasian Brit to actually go to China to explain why India is doing uh, you know, so much better than China. What's also interesting about this chart is the fact, in fact both charts, is that you have on here, you have on this chart, you have the leading uh, Russian uh, generic company, you have on there the leading um, Turkish company, you have on there the leading um, um, uh, South African company, you have the leading Brazilian company, so there are strong leaders from the BRIC markets except for the one place of being in China. And, and I, the answer to the question as to why I believe the, uh, the Chinese have never internationalized, whereas the Indians have, and incidentally, the Japanese haven't really either, is the fact that if you are going to globalize, you've got to make sufficient money at home to invest that when you go around the world. And if you can't make enough money at home, then you really aren't able to carry out that globalization. And the Indians have made a lot of money at home on their pharma trade. The Chinese have had price cuts sometimes twice, three times a year. The Japanese have had price cuts every two years. And these price cuts have taken the legs off the local domestic industry and not allowed it to move as rapidly uh, or at all in the Chinese case, although the Chinese have now allocated $19 billion to invest in their local domestic industry, of which one-third is for new plant, one-third is for new equipment, and one-third is for training, which is a sizable investment uh, in, this, uh, in this industry and, and is a sign as to why there is so much anxiety in China. In fact, uh, when I was there, there was people stood on the stage and said, beating their chests and saying, we can sell satellites, we can sell bridges, we can sell roads, we can sell almost anything except generic pharmaceuticals. What is wrong with us? And uh, it's therefore an interesting model in terms of seeing exactly you know, how, um, how the two have compared. This is, some, this is in uh, Indian rupee crores, so you probably don't understand the, 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 the numbers, but the significance is the right-hand column, which shows you the percentage share of the exports of the pharmaceutical business. And you can see how wide it is. You can see how it covers so many different countries. Clearly, the USA is the number one. And if you added up a number of European markets, you get a big European figure. And you also have on here representatives from the um, Asian countries with, uh, I think, Vietnam and, and, uh, and Singapore. So there is quite a truly global industry that has grown out of this sector as regards industry. And part of it comes into the deregulated markets, by that Europe, Japan, the USA, and part of it comes into the semi-regulated markets, meaning um, basically Africa, Asia, uh, and uh, Latin America. And what's interesting is to see how actually Rambaxi did get there. 
And this is a sort of time scale in terms of how, in, how Rambaxi globalized out of India, because initially that 80% when it was just concentrating on the domestic market was in India, Sri Lanka, and, uh, and Nepal. And then the first areas that actually Rambaxi went to included Thailand. Thailand, Malaysia, Nigeria were the first places in this globalization that actually Rambaxi put its feet down. And it was also, in those days, also quite strong in, uh, in Burma, in Myanmar as well. In fact, if you go to Myanmar and you look at the shelves in the hospitals of pharmaceuticals, you'll see wall to wall of um, Rambaxi uh, products. And then he moved into Russia, Ukraine. There was a great trade between, um, in those days, between Russia and uh, India, because the Indians needed uh, armaments and the uh, Russians needed pharmaceuticals. So they did a trade. And even today, the Indian brands are very well known on the streets of um, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then they moved into China, UK and Ireland, with manufacturing facilities in Ireland and China, and then slowly sort of grew from there around the world, filling in the holes, uh, moving into um, French West Africa and South Africa and some of the other BRIC countries, and then formed a base in the USA, and then some of the other countries, and eventually, in the last few years, they moved into uh, Romania and then Japan. And Japan has always been a kind of difficult market for, for the Indians to enter, because you can imagine it, the, you know, the Japanese are always on time, a little bit early, and the Indians are always late. And the, you know, the Indians are, are very good at uh, being very casual, and the Japanese are very sort of uh, well, smartly dressed. And the Indians talk about cricket, and the Japanese talk about basketball, and uh, they don't really understand each other's game. And the Indians are vegetarians, and the Japanese like the fish. So there's lots of different sort of uh, differences in that cultural connection, but those have all been overtaken. And in fact, today, there is quite an active presence of Indian companies in Japan. And in fact, in Rambaxi's case, a Japanese company owns now Rambaxi. And then this led to this sort of globalization of uh, subsidiaries. You can see here that Rambaxi was ranked sort of ninth at this particular moment in time in terms of the number of subsidiaries. But you can see a number of other sectors in India where there are sizable number of uh, subsidiaries around the world, whether it's real estate, or whether it's uh, engineering services or petroleum or in the auto machines. So there is actually quite a, a strong trend in terms of globalizing out of India, which has been driven by a really profitable business that there is at home. Going back to pharmaceuticals, just to give you a flavor of how strong the Indian picture is, a DMF is a regulatory document you get for selling um, raw materials on the US market. And you can see here that actually India represents something like 56% in the last quarter of all filings in America. So India represents one in two of the filings. And if you look at the Chinese filings, this is, this is exactly the same comparison, China represents 19%. So China represents, of these, these raw materials, it represents about 19% to the 56% that there is with respect to um, India. Uh, and then you have the formulations, the tablets, the liquids that you get in pharmaceuticals. India, you can see how it took off in the 1998 and is now representing probably about one in two of the actual, an ANDA is a regulatory file for a tablet or a capsule. So now India represents one in two of the finished products that are actually on the US marketplace. And this tells you what's going to happen in the next three or four years because it's all the files that are waiting at the American FDA, waiting for approval. And what's interesting, that this is the top 12 companies with files waiting for approval, and of those 12 companies, nine are Indian. So there's one Israeli, there's one American, sorry, there's two American, and there's nine Indian companies in terms of the number of files waiting for approval. You know, there's nobody, no other country in the world after the nine Indians, you know, anybody else has got a smaller number that's waiting, which is a sign of the future strength that uh, India will have, and you could also argue that China would have, which is gonna be limited um, compared to this strength as he's sitting there and waiting for uh, approval. 
The other thing about India is actually it gets a lot of support from the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, because these uh, three columns, one is HIV, in fact, there's a meeting in this building on HIV at the moment, malaria, and then tuberculosis. And if you take all those products and you look at the source of the products in the developing world, you find that 64%, that's the right-hand column, 64% come from India. So two out of three of products in the developing world for these three major disease areas are coming from India. So if there's any involvement by government, and this is one of the issues about doing business in India, is that actually when you are globalizing, the government is, uh, can be a, a certain amount of, um, of issues you have to deal with, but 64% of these products go to the developing world. So the end, the, the non, you know, these, these organizations, like the World Health Organization, Medicines Sans Frontier, are all supporting India to make sure that its business grows and that they can use it, use these medicines in the developing world. So they get that support, which counterbalances some of the negative things that come from the Indian government. Now, talking about sort of the Indian environment and the, and the bureaucracy, this is a civil servant's office in, in India, and they, in India they say that the British invented bureaucracy and the Indians perfected it. And this is one of the challenges of actually growing out of India because you have to deal with these, uh, these issues. And in fact, most Indian companies will have a team of 10 or 20 people that do nothing else but focus on moving files from, from ministers' tables to ministers' tables. I'm not talking about anything in, with respect to bribery and corruption. I'm just talking about moving things along so that actually they can work the process. One of the other issues about India is that the, the legal system is relatively slow and there is, it, is a, it is a challenge. But in spite of these things, you've seen the results that have taken place. And, and what's interesting is I, when, I was, uh, when I was living in India, one of the things I did was, was have um, European Assessment Center people analyze 200 managers around the world and then and the assessment center person compared this Indian management team with Western big pharma companies. And the comparison between the Indian management team and the Western management team was these four or five points. The first thing was that on the Indian numbers, there were some absolutely brilliant minds with perfect scores on some of these tests that you do in these assessment centers, which actually they'd never seen before. And of course, in India, mathematics are very strong, and so is chemistry. And paradoxically, in China, it, well, many people believe that biology is stronger in China, and whereas chemistry is stronger in India. And, and the other aspect about the Indian management style was that they are great achievers. They can go out and they can get. And it's really driven by the fact that deregulation was only 15 years ago, that they were encouraged to go and do things, and, and, you know, you can set an Indian team a target and they go for it. Interestingly enough, the weaker area and the thing that actually comes to the fore as you globalize, as you globalize, you need to have the softer skills of persuasion and motivation and encouragement, not go and do it. It means, you know, we together will work together and we will go and achieve this. And, and as you globalize and you have an international workforce, it was the softer skills that the Indian teams had to grasp with, and which is actually one of the issues when you globalize, you've got to really add to your skill set of not only delivering and achieving, you've also got to have that issue of persuasion. So there was a lot of training on team building and, um, and investing in, uh, in, uh, in training, and this was part of the plan of actually globalizing. One of the other aspects about India is everybody thinks there are these very strong males and that it's a very male orientated environment but there are some very successful ladies that are in the Indian workforce and this just happened to be business uh, in India business today which actually had on the front page a number of very successful female CEOs that are actually running Indian businesses and and the other aspect of of India is that it's not just um, uh, generic medicines there is now a growing interest in having patented medicines and this is one of the earlier, in fact, the earliest uh, patented molecule developed out of India, which was announced earlier this year, 
But this chart, which I'm sure you can't read the detail of, but it is a summary of all the new molecules. These are patented molecules which are coming out of India. So there is an evolution from the global generic area into a newer area of patented medicines which actually are developed at a much lower cost than Big Pharma and is why there's a lot of interest in India in terms of buying Indian companies because as you globalize, you become more and more uh, uh, noticed and people are more interested, they see the opportunities and here you can see some of the acquisitions that have taken place in the last five years or so of which some are really quite significant like the Rambaxi one and the Permal one where they were actually billions of dollars were exchanged hands for uh, Indian companies. And this sort of summarizes my, my, uh, my sort of uh, my presentation, and this is my last slide, that actually this healthcare globalization, which has already been achieved in a number of uh, companies, is continuing because there are mid-sized companies now which are actually going down the same path and are actually growing and are actually looking to um, expand globally. And there's a couple that I'm actually on the board of, Fortis Healthcare and Glenmark Pharmaceuticals, which actually are um, on this path in terms of um, internationalizing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to you as well, Dr. Brian Tempest. Now, if we do have questions, we are running out of time here. If you could kindly write down your questions on a piece of paper and hand them to the staff. So just put up your hand, a staff will come running to you, and then we'll collect all that and we'll answer those questions in a timely manner. But thank you so very much indeed to you, Dr. Brian Tempest. They're giving us insight into India and, of course, we've all found out now that um, India has the advantage in education unlike here in Thailand where according to Kun Bantun he gave us the opinion that infrastructure in terms of education here is still weak and has a long way to go and on top of that India's strength is in generic pharmaceuticals and we saw there from the statistics, et cetera, on your PowerPoint presentation, how one Indian pharmaceuticals company, Rambaxi, did it, globalized out from India and then into nearby Sri Lanka and then Nepal and then eventually into the Middle East, Europe and the rest of the world. Once again, thank you very much indeed to you, Dr. Brian Tempest.